All right. Well, it's a minute past the hour already. We can get started. And then if other people join a little bit later, uh, they will miss the first few slides, but that's OK. Um, I think they'll be able to uh, get right to it. Um, welcome, everybody, to this wonderful green energy series. Um, thank you for getting up out of bed uh, by at least 10 in the morning on a Saturday in November uh, with the time change. And so now it's getting, uh, in theory, light a little bit more um, than before. Um, and so in this green energy series, we're going to be recapping a year of green energy series. And the reason why we need a recap is because a, this is a fast moving landscape. And um, believe it or not, some of the things that we have presented to you uh, in past green energy series have sort of changed in the, in the grand scheme of just one year. And so uh, we'll, uh, we want to provide some updates uh, using this presentation. And so this presentation is uh, a part of Solar Oregon. Uh, Solar Oregon is a nonprofit uh, in Oregon that has been around for uh, over 40 years. And um, it is a nonprofit uh, with a goal of helping uh, more people be able to adopt uh, solar. Um, we do that through giving uh, education, outreaches. Um, uh, some of our premier activities are like our uh, annual Go Zero Tour. Um, it is a home tour uh, that showcases homes that have solar and energy efficient appliances um, and really uh, efforts to make their uh, people's homes more uh, with greater insulation and air sealing. Um, this past Go Zero uh, tour, there was a home um, that had a uh, that had a passive house envelope. Um, it was really cool. Um, the walls were really thick, and uh, the whole house could be heated with one ductless heat pump, and that that's just truly amazing. Um, that a home can do uh, require such small uh, heating and cooling loads, and uh, which is which allows it to be easily. Um, uh, it be self-powered with just solar panels. Um, so that's one of the tours that uh, um, has occurred. Uh, solar Oregon has another tour, um, a solar winery tour. Um, this photo here uh, on the right-hand side is from a solar winery tour. Um, and we also do uh, a lot of peer-to-peer -to -peer -to -peer education events, um, such as this one, uh, where uh, you guys are encouraged to ask questions, and it's generally a smaller group, and uh, we can really kind of dive deep and learn uh, about the intricacies of uh, solar technology and um, policies and uh, other cool stuff. So Solar Oregon is a uh, small organization with a very small and nimble staff. Um, we have pretty modest budgets um, to get all the things that we want to get done, uh, but uh, it's not a zero budget, so uh, it would be appreciated if uh, you support our work. Um, you can support our work uh, by using this uh, link here or um, just visiting Solar Oregon uh, website and uh, finding the donate link. And you're encouraged to use the Q&A uh, to ask questions. Um, and so please use the, those features of Zoom. Again, uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Edward Louie. Uh, during the Monday through Friday day job, I work at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as a building energy efficiency research engineer. Um, but uh, I love this type of work so much that uh, it, it's, it's often very difficult to figure out uh, where work stops and my personal interest begins. Um, <laughs> I have a house full of um, heat pumps and uh, other energy efficient technologies. Um, I'm building a tiny house that is off the grid and zero energy. Um, and originally I built that with the idea of, well, I can't necessarily afford to play with these kind of maybe uh, more niche and slightly more expensive technologies at a scale of a full size home, but I can certainly afford to do that in a tiny home. So we build a tiny house and turn it into a tiny house lab. And so the lab is chucked full of energy efficient construction details and products. So <laughs> it's one of my hobbies. Um, and we want to provide this disclaimer before we dig into the details uh, that um, the 
views in this presentation do not necessarily represent Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, U.S. Department of Energy, or Solar Oregon. And uh, while best efforts have been made to convey facts and information accurately, you're encouraged to do your own research and your own calculations before making investment decisions. And with that, we're going to dive into the meat of this presentation. So, uh, so what are some of the things that need recapping and what's new and what has changed in just one year of Green Energy Series? Uh, one thing that is uh, a major shift is that uh, in the course of one in the, uh, this past year, uh, the automotive industry has made a change uh, in terms of which plug that future electric vehicles would like to build towards. Um, and so the change went from a combined charging system to what is now called North American uh, uh, Charging Standard, or uh, and that is the Tesla plug. So Tesla open sourced their plug. We'll talk about that more. Uh, we'll talk about uh, updates on vehicle to home. And then uh, in the grand scheme of a year, uh, a bunch of new products came out, uh, newer batteries, uh, bigger and cheaper solar panels, and easier to install inverters. Um, and then uh, in a previous uh, presentation, um, I briefly began talking about uh, how to uh, calculate uh, kilograms of operational carbon from different uh, photovoltaic uh, configurations, ones that have just solar and ones that have solar plus battery. And uh, since that presentation, I have uh, worked with my colleagues at Pacific Northwest National Lab to really drill down and figure out how to do this calculation uh, easily uh, by anybody. And so we'll share with you the results and step-by-step -step how you can do these calculations yourself. Um, and uh, in the this past year, I had a um, two week long experience with a Tesla vehicle and a Tesla power wall. And I've learned some things about uh, Tesla cars and Tesla power walls and solar panels and how those things interact. And um, I found something that about that setup that's not super great, but uh, we'll present to you exactly what that detail is and uh, that it's theoretically very solvable through a software update. So that's good. Um, and then we'll also talk about um, major electric rate changes um, that are on the way um, starting uh, January of next year and um, and why these rate changes uh, really provide an even greater incentive to go to uh, adopt solar PV. And so that's kind of the meat and potatoes of this presentation. And um, so, yeah, as I alluded to, uh, one of the major changes that happened this past year is um, Tesla open sourced the uh, their plug and they're calling it the North American Charging Standard. And so uh, this is a major change because um, as a result of this uh, open sourcing of the plug, pretty much all the major car, uh, automotive manufacturers opted to switch from supporting a future that uses combined charging system or this plug on the middle of the picture uh, to using the what is formerly called the Tesla plug, but now it's called the North American Charging Standard plug. And the reason why um, automotive manufacturers made the switch um, is because right now, today, there is about three times the number of uh, Tesla plugs as there are combined charging uh, standard plugs uh, in the wild. So um, the Tesla plug slash the North American charging standard plug has a much bigger head start in terms of just deploying um, the number of chargers. And that's really important uh, in terms of EV adoption is you just need to have um, high, high speed uh, charging uh, chargers that are as ubiquitous as gas stations uh, across the country. And Tesla clearly has a lead. And so it made sense that um, a lot of vehicle manufacturers uh, would choose that as the standard to build to. Um, and it, that's the main reason, but there are additional reasons. Um, the North American charging standard plug is much smaller, as you can see. Uh, so as a result, it's easier to aesthetically integrate that, uh, the plugging the plug sockets into the car design um, while keeping, for example, the flapping door um, really small so it doesn't affect the aesthetic uh, design of the vehicle. Um, in the last presentation about uh, uh, vehicle to home and vehicle to grid technology, uh, we talked about uh, some ISO standards 
um, that have been uh, solidified in the last year um, that will make vehicle to home and vehicle to grid possible. And we also talked about how that those communication standards um, are codified in the a logo that is the plug and charge logo that is shown in the lower uh, part of the slide. And the nice thing is that this switch from uh, combined charging system to North American charging standard, uh, all those standards uh, that were uh, in place for vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, uh, were transferred over to North American charging standards. So there's no change in uh, the uh, rolling out of vehicle to home and vehicle to grid uh, capabilities. And so uh, don't worry about that being an issue. Um, so this switch to North American uh, uh, charging standard is going to take until uh, 2025. Um, so don't expect that like you're going to magically see a ton of vehicles come out between now and 25 uh, that have this plug. Like this, this is going to be a plug transition. <laughs> so um, it will take some time, uh, but it, it, it's slated to happen uh, because all the vehicle manufacturers have made made their uh, commitments. And so uh, one of the hallmarks of a uh, the combined charging system plug is that uh, it was combined. So if we look at the top half of, of this plug, this is a J1772 plug, um, which is the most common plug that uh, is on electric vehicles today. And then it's combined with uh, the DC fast charging pins, and that's why it's called combined charging system. So uh, knowing that the vast majority of vehicle electric vehicles today, and also plug-in hybrids, uh, use the J1772 plug, um, what is this switch to North American charging standard uh, going to affect existing vehicles? Like, uh, are existing vehicles still going to be able to plug in and charge? Um, and the answer is yes. There is already uh, a pretty modestly priced adapter that allows uh, one to plug in a Tesla plug or North American charging standard plug uh, to the end of it. And then uh, once the, the output side of the adapter is a J1772 plug uh, that allows uh, pre-existing uh, electric vehicles to charge at a maximum of 48 amps at 250 volts, which is really the, uh, you know, more than the charging current that most of these uh, ex existing uh, electric vehicles can even charge at. Um, like, for example, like my vehicle, I think maxes out at like 25 amps or something like that. It won't be able to accept more energy than that. Um, so there will be no uh, f future problems with uh, access to charging uh, if you have an electric vehicle that you purchased uh, today or, you know, last you know, eight or nine years. So you're, you're, you'll be fine. Um, so that's that's really good. And then, um, as I said, this plug change uh, to, uh, to North American charging standard really isn't making uh, uh, any changes in terms of the deployment of products uh, that can do vehicle to home or vehicle to grid. Um, and, and during the past presentations, I said that, well, we weren't sure when this technology will become uh, commercially available in terms of products. And um, that uh, one of the updates has, is that a number of manufacturers, uh, in, uh, Emporia being uh, one, is um, making promises that a product that can do vehicle to home will be available in 2024. And um, the some they've already released specs on these products. And one of the cool specs is that um, this box here, as you can see, is quite a bit bigger than um, a typical uh, uh, level two charger that you have you can buy. Um, for your electric vehicle. And the reason why it's quite a bit bigger is because it actually has an inverter um, inside this box that can convert high voltage DC uh, energy from your car's battery to 120 volts and 240 volts split phase uh, that the home uses. And it actually has a 11 and a half kilowatts inverter inside this box. And so 11.5 um, kW is an inverter that can power a whole house easily. Um, there, you know, there's some caveats, you know, you cannot power your whole house if you have all four burners of your electric stove on, plus the oven, uh, 
uh, plus running a dryer, plus running your heat pump. But uh, honestly, like you'll even in a normal situation where you're not trying to run your house off of your car's battery, um, very rarely does anyone turn on that many you know uh, burners on their stove plus the oven. And so um, I have tracked the peak energy use at my house, and it has never you know come close to eleven kilowatts. Uh, so. Um, this is more than enough energy to power our house. Um, and so this is really exciting because um, this opens the door to, you know, not necessarily needing to purchase uh, you know, home batteries or uh, one can purchase a very modestly uh, sized home battery. And then uh, when they realize that, you know, their home, their power outage has, has occurred, um, the modestly sized home battery will be able to carry the load uh, for the duration long enough to, you know, get into the garage and plug in the car and then have the car's battery also assist in powering the home for the rest of the uh, power outage uh, duration. So um, really cool stuff. Uh, currently, no, no uh, pricing available yet from Emporia, but uh, knowing Emporia as a company, um, we can expect that this will be a fairly reasonably priced uh, products because Emporia, for example, is one of the companies that um, uh, prov produces very reasonably priced products. Um, so, and in many past green energy series, I have mentioned that uh, a 48 volt low voltage DC batteries um, is likely to be a really good choice to bet on uh, for future proofing um, a, a PV plus battery uh, setup. And the reason why for that is because um, 48 volts DC is a kind of a universal uh, uh, voltage standard that allows different brands of batteries to actually be paired together and have the different brands of batteries still be able to play well together um, as you expand the amount, number of batteries. Like you don't need to necessarily buy uh, all of your home batteries to be this brand and this particular model for uh, the system to work. Uh, so that's really good. Um, but uh, in the 48 volt uh, battery space, I described that it's a wild, wild west, um, a lot of batteries being produced uh, by different manufacturers. There's an infinite choice, um, which is very good. It drives down the price. Uh, but that not all those batteries uh, have undergone um, the UL safety testing um, that is pretty important uh, for uh, getting a system that uh, a building inspector will actually sign off on and um, and approve for use. Uh, you can always, you know, do it off label and, you know, not tell the building inspector about it. And, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time you'll be safe. But uh, if something were to go wrong, um, who knows, you know, how bad could it could be. That's why there's UL, uh, these UL standards that test the battery. They actually uh, uh, force the battery into a thermal runaway so that um, it will be, you'll catch on fire and, um, and to see how that fire spreads to other cells inside the battery uh, array. And then uh, to, can the enclosure that the battery cells are put into uh, actually contain the fire, um, et cetera. And this battery, for example, has undergone all those testings uh, to indicate that it is um, a, a, it will fail in a safe way. And um, even after paying for all the testing, the, the, the price of the battery is still very reasonable. Um, it, this is uh, over half the price of the Tesla Powerwall. Uh, one of the reasons why um, uh, 48 volts uh, DC coupled batteries are much more reasonably priced compared to like a Tesla Powerwall 2 uh, is that they're only selling you the battery. They don't have to sell you an inverter that comes with the battery in order to be AC coupled. Um, but uh, there's also like, you know, the Tesla upcharge is kind of like the, the Apple upcharge. Um, <laughs> so uh, not having to deal with that also contributes to the, the cost of the battery being less. Um, but even at this uh, reasonable price, there's still very good warranties. 8,000 cycle uh, expected life is translates to about 21.2 years if you were to cycle it once each day. Um, so 
if anything in a house lasts 21 and a half years, I consider that to be a very good life. Um, and it's not like uh, the, the batter will just instantly die and not work on the after the 21 and a half years, they'll continue to work. Um, but, uh, you know, there may be a, a reduction in capacity, but the if we do get to that state and you're not happy with the uh, reduced uh, storage capacity of the battery, you can always add another one because, as I said before, um, 48 volt uh, DC coupled batteries is a kind of a universal voltage standard. So it's very easy to add more batteries uh, if you decide to do so in the course of, you know, the next 21 years, for example. Um, this one is uh, all weather rated. So uh, if you want to like not reduce the amount of space you have in your uh, garage or in your closets inside the house, you can put it outside, uh, hang on the side of the house and uh, you know the rain can hit it and it'll still be uh, perfectly fine. Um, it's kind of the generally the preferred choice. Um, a lot of people choose not to put their batteries inside their garage or inside a utility closet, but they just hang on the outside of the house. Um, and this how this battery can handle it. Um, so another major change is uh, I've mentioned in a past presentation that uh, solar panels keep getting bigger uh, and bigger is better in that uh, you for each panel, uh, there's you need fewer panels to be installed on your roof in order to achieve the kilowatt uh, uh, you want for the overall array size. And less panels means less mounting hardware and less power optimizers if you want to put a power optimizer on each panel and less labor to uh, you know assemble all the parts and pieces together. And so those are the ways that you gain major uh, cost savings for a project is you know, reducing the miscellaneous hardware and reducing the, the labor cost. Um, so even if bigger panels were to cost more, it would be worth it to pay for the premium for the latest, greatest, biggest panels uh, for the labor savings or miscellaneous mounting hardware cost associated with a solar uh, installation. But no, the latest and greatest, biggest panels available are typically some of the cheapest panels you can get. Um, uh, I've said in past presentations that um, if you can get panels for less than 50 cents a watt, um, that's great. And this one is 48 cents a watt. So uh, it meets that checkbox. Um, and, and yet this is a 532 watt uh, panel with bifacial gains capability. Um, the, one thing that's really cool in the world of solar is that um, bifacial uh, gains is now a standard feature on pretty much all panels. Um, and the reason why is because uh, the most expensive part of a solar panel is that silicon silicon grade uh, uh, wafer to make the solar uh, cell, and it's really expensive to refine beach sand to the level of purity needed to make uh, the solar cell. Um, and so, one of the ways that solar panel manufacturers make it cheaper uh, is to make that slice of the uh, silicon to be really, really thin, to so give you less of it. Um, and the byproduct of making it really, really thin is that it becomes kind of semi-transparent. And so um, uh, if we then arrange the layers and the, the circuitry of that really, really thin um, uh, silicon, then we can actually get energy capture with when the sunlight goes through the panel. But then if it bounces off, like for example, a white metal roof, uh, and then the, so the diffuse uh, lights uh, uh, bouncing back out of the panel um, that we can they're, that they're able to put uh, energy capturing uh, circuitry on the backside too and so then uh, you gain additional uh, production so that's how you go from 532 I mean 535 to like you know 600 or beyond uh, is by that by also capturing the energy uh, ref of the reflected light coming back through the panel the second time um, don't expect to ever get 650. Um, that's under like laboratory ideal conditions, but nonetheless, you know, get, be able to capture some energy on the re on the return trip will be able to get you beyond the 535 watts. Uh, uh it, it's maybe like 580, 590. Um, I'm just saying don't, don't expect to ever get 650, but you know, it'll be somewhere in between the 
535 number and the 650. It'll never be the 650. <laughs> um, uh, so another really cool change uh, is that the industry of uh, solar inverters is moving more and more to the all-in-one inverter design. Um, what I mean by that is, um, as you can see in this middle picture here, uh, this is a traditional uh, in solar uh, inverter setup uh, where there's the inverter isn't in, shown in the red square, but there's, look, there's all these other white squares of hardware that's needed to make the system safe and to make the system work. Um, for example, there's the combiner box, there's DC disconnect and the AC disconnect. And these other pieces of hardware that's needed to make the uh, solar uh, array work and to make it safe. Um, there, they have a cost associated with them, but even more so, it, there's a cost associated with uh, field connections, field made connections by, by electrician to put all these pieces together and to you know mount them on the wall. Um, and it's kind of ugly too to have a side of your house with all these different boxes that are wired together. Um, so uh, the new solar inverters that are coming out, uh, everybody's trying to move towards this all in one design because there's a realization that while the inverter costs more money uh, because there's now like four pieces of equipment that traditionally were separate now squished into one. So, you know, there's a, a, the additional hardware that, that costs that makes the inverter more expensive, but there's an overall net savings uh, because uh, labor, electrician labor is really expensive. Um, and uh, there's also compatibility issues or, you know, sometimes, uh, somebody might purchase a DC disconnect, you know, buy the cheapest one they can find. And actually maybe it's um, not really safe uh, as a, uh, as a hardware. So then um, if it's all in one, then all the different circuit breakers and disconnects are actually, you know, tested under uh, laboratory conditions to ensure that everything does work when put together. Um, and so, as you can see, this is one example of an all in one inverter. Um, you can see here PV inputs, you know, there's, uh, looks like four four PV inputs. So like um, uh, this combiner box, you can have four strings come in to this uh, inverter and um, it will be able to, you can land the individual strings into its own individual um, MPPT power point, maximum power point tracking um, uh, circuits. And so then you don't need a combiner box because you can just combine within this uh, inverter box um, and then up here, you have circuit breakers, uh, for example, for the battery, and then you have circuit breakers for the load side and the grid side. And so then that takes care of the DC disconnects. Um, and then you also have lots of space left over to actually like, you know, wrangle the, the, the fat wires that are needed uh, to, you know, get the battery and the uh, load and the grid side uh, wires um, landed. Because um, when you think about the main wire uh, electrical wire from the grid coming to your house. That's not a skinny wire. That's kind of fat. So it, or there's bend radiuses and just cha challenges to wrangling that wire. And there's plenty of space inside this box to wrangle the wire and get it landed. So that's really cool to um, that all this stuff can be done inside the box. And then this, when you close the door, it's got gaskets to seal it out of, uh, from water. Um, so uh, that, you know, it's, it's perfectly safe to be placed outside. Um, and we'll meet all the uh, different uh, building uh, safety inspection uh, requirements. Um, so an update on uh, PV uh, carbon calculations. Um, there was a previous presentation where I, <laughs> I was still trying to figure out how to do these types of calculations. And so I said, well, this in general, this is what the trend is going to be, but I didn't actually have data to show you. But uh, now I've really kind of figured out how to do these calculations. And um, so here are the results. Um, so how this graph works is that um, uh, the blue bar is uh, kilograms of CO2 imported by wire to meet uh, this home's electric loads. And then um, if there's any, the orange bars is kilogram of CO2 credit from energy export to the grid. And so that's why in the no PV condition, you have nothing. Um, and then the gray bar is the is what the result of subtracting the orange bar from the blue bar and then results in the gray bar. So uh, for example, in no, v, no PV condition, 
uh, you have nothing to subtract because there's no orange bar. So your gray bar looks is the same height as the blue bar. Um, and so without PV, um, a home in Portland, Oregon that uses um, 10,900 kilowatt hours per year uh, would import uh, three and 3.3 um, thousand uh, kilograms of CO2 by wire. Um, that's a lot of kil uh, CO2. Um, you know, that's more than an elephant uh, weighs. Uh, worth of CO2, and that's just for one home. Um, if you have uh, PV, then uh, in order to net zero energy on this home, uh, you need uh, 9.1 kilowatt of PV. Uh, but uh, if you have just PV, what happens is that at night, when the sun is not shining, um, you are going to be buying electricity from the grid. And, and that electricity at night tends to be dirtier than electricity during the day because uh, during the day, even the electric utility has utility uh, scale solar, and um, so they're able to, you know, dilute the um, energy mix and reduce the amount of energy that needs to be produced by natural gas and other fossil-based uh, production sources. And so, in the daytime, uh, the electric utility's energy mix is cleaner. But uh, since if you just have a PV-only system, then at night you're not able to store any of the uh, uh, PV energy produced from your own rooftop solar into the batteries. And so you're buying kilowatt hours from the grid at night. And then you're also buying kilowatt hours from the grid during the winter time. And so as a result, um, there's associated carbon with that. Uh, and so that's shown in the blue bar. So you're, you, you do save some carbon uh, by having a PV system. And then the energy that you send back to the grid does offset some carbon, even though you're exporting during the day when the grid is relatively clean. Um, so, you know, by the time you subtract out the energy, the CO2 credits from the energy sent back to the grid, you end up with a gray bar. But uh, as you can see, it's still nowhere near as low of a gray bar as if you have batteries. So um, you, you get definitely a CO2 savings by having PV, but you get in a subsequent better CO2 savings um, by just having a battery, um, but uh, in or in order, like, if you ask the question, well, how do I get this gray bar to zero or close to zero, like so that I can not only net zero energy because nine point one kilowatt is net zero energy, but if I want to net zero carbon, um, how do I do that? And the answer is, you need an even bigger PV system, um, and so with a bigger PV system, you generate enough excess kilowatt hours during the time when the grid is relatively clean like i said um you need to you need to generate a lot of excess kilowatt hours during the hours when the grid is relatively clean in order to build up enough uh kilograms of uh co2 credit from those large amounts of excess kilowatt hours uh, sent back to the grid when the grid is really relatively clean in order to make up for the kilowatt hours you buy from the grid, um, mostly in November, December, January, and February, kind of those dark doom and gloom uh, months uh, when uh, you just, can't, even if you have a humongous PV system, you just really can't generate much more. Um, so you just need to buy some carbon-based uh, uh, electricity uh, from the grid. And so that will use up those uh, kilogram uh, of CO2 credits uh, from like the massive amounts of excess generate generation from the summer. So um, in this analysis, uh, you need to generate um, about 3,500 kilowatt hours of excess energy beyond net zero energy in order to get enough uh, uh, CO2 credits from these 3,500 kilowatt hours uh, of, uh, of excess generation in order to build, build up enough uh, CO2 credits to finally uh, be able to net zero. Uh, in the carbon front. Um, so yeah, the conclusion is that you need to generate a lot of excess kilowatt hours in the summer in order to offset the 30 kilowatt hours purchased in the winter. Um, and so uh, you can do this calculation yourself. And here are the step-by-step -step, uh, ways to do it. Um, one is uh, if you really want to know, okay, how much energy for sure your home uses in a year uh, is, is to electrify your home 
and then install a, a energy monitor, um, Emporia, uh, a brand we've talked about in the uh, previous slide, makes a wonderful low cost uh, 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 energy monitor that can not only monitor the main uh, wires coming from the grid, but also you can install sen a sensor on each um, circuit breaker um, and monitor the energy uh, use of each circuit breaker. And if you have those circuit breakers labeled correctly, then you can also like uh, ass assign those same labels into Emporia. And then you can know, okay, well, how much energy does my dryer use or my stove or my dishwasher? You know, if you have those major appliances broken into um, dedicated circuits, then you can track the energy and they create pie charts. But uh, the cool thing is that like uh, energy monitor that it can produce uh, hourly resolution energy data. And if you operate this energy monitor for one year, you get, you know, how much energy your home uses uh, each hour of each day for the entire year. So that's important data to have. Uh, step two is to download um, data from NREL that gives you uh, the kilogram of CO2 that the grid uh, energy mix is by each state. Um, and uh, in, in the case of Oregon, you find the Oregon data in this ex humongous Excel file and copy the 8,760 hours of the year uh, hourly grid um, CO2 data out of this uh, database. And then um, uh, step three is you, you need to have some solar. So even if you don't have solar on your roof right now, um, you can size a solar system uh, from NREL's PV watts calculator. And um, down, if you scroll down, which I did not know this, uh, that you can scroll down a little bit, and there's actually a download button for hourly data. Um, because I normally I, when I go to PV watts, uh, the output, it shows this uh, main part here, which is each month and the uh, number of kilowatt hours generated in each month. But um, <laughs> in this little tiny... Uh, uh, button to click for hourly when you scroll down, uh, you can actually get hourly um, data for the PV system generation. And so uh, once you have a, uh, one through step one through three, uh, that's all the different data sources you need in order to do the calculation from the previous slide. Um, and so then you bring in data from steps one, two, and three into spreadsheet. Um, then you can select the battery size and then program some uh, Excel formulas to then so that the spreadsheet will be able to um, buy kilowatt hours from the grid when the PV can't meet the load and the battery is fully depleted, and then export excess kilowatt hours of surplus energy to the grid um, when both the uh, energy use of the home, which you have from step one, uh, is met by the PV generation that is from step three and the battery is full. Um, so then, you know, whatever kilowatt hours you sur surplus to the grid, you can then multiply it by, okay, the data from step two to know, okay, well, what is the kilogram of CO2 credit that you'll get from that kilowatt of sent back to the grid? Um, additionally, this uh, in step four, this spreadsheet, um, uh, I have the spreadsheet kind of created and um, you can, you know, repopulate the columns of the data from uh, like, for example, step one and step three. Uh, that you have for your site-specific uh, energy um, situation. So um, we can share with you the spreadsheet to make step four easier. But the the uh, once you get the spreadsheet, you'll realize that the formulas that uh, have been programmed to the spreadsheet are quite basic formulas that don't take a lot of sophistication to be able to figure out how to program those formulas. Um, so that's how that's done. Um, and uh, this past year, I had the privilege of um, staying at a friend's house that had a, a solar system on the roof. Uh, he had a Powerwall 2 to, uh, and then also a Tesla EV. And um, th this home is on the island of Maui. And um, Maui has a strange um, situation with the uh, electric company's relationship with P uh, residential PV in that um, they have so many residents with um, rooftop PV systems that uh, the uh, Maui Electric uh, Utility is not interested in providing uh, net metering to subsequent customers that came in after the initial bunch that installed solar. And so this home was one that came in a little bit late. And so uh, Maui's electric, uh, the electric utility provides uh, $0 of um, uh, net metering credit for excess energy sent back to the grid. So you're just donating those kilowatt hours. And so um, 
the Tesla uh, Model 3 my friend has, uh, it has a humongous battery. Um, so, a, you know, I had the idea of thinking, well, um, wouldn't it be nice if when the Tesla Powerwall 2 is fully charged, that it'll automatically start slowly charging the Tesla battery so that we're not donating kilowatt hours to the grid, but instead just capturing whatever excess energy the solar a rooftop solar is generating after it has met the load and fully charged the power wall too. Um, wouldn't that be nice? Um, but uh, turns out this is not a feature that Tesla has implemented. So Tesla does allow you to, in the car, adjust the charging current, and you can also adjust this on the app. But uh, there's not a way to actually uh, have the uh, software automatically vary the charging current based on a excess availability of rooftop solar. Um, and so as a result, one of the things I did was, okay, well, estimate, okay, like for example here, uh, if this is steady state, which rooftop solar PV is never steady state, but you know, it, you can you know say, well, let's just assume it's steady state. 3.7 kilowatt of X solar and the home is using 2.6. Okay, so then there's roughly one kilowatt hour of excess generation and if this power wall is full then we can adjust this down to you know one kilowatt and the way you can do that math is okay it's 240 volts so a thousand um uh, uh, a thousand watt hours okay divide that by 240 volts then you need to be charging at around four or five amps uh in order to use just one kilowatt and so you can then click the minus button all the way down to like five amps and then plug in the car and it'll charge at five amps, which is about one kilowatt. Um, and then there, therefore now your home uses 3.7 you know, kilowatts. And then so now you're not exporting anything to the grid. But, you know, that's a huge annoyance to have to um, babysit the system and manually do this um, when in fact, you know, Tesla owns and the software to the Powerwall 2, and they also have owned the software to the vehicle. You know, you would think if both of those uh, uh, pieces of equipment are available to be, you know, set from a app on your phone, that, you know, it'll take the data from the two sides and um, make this adjustment automatically. Um, so that's why I'm saying that, you know, this software update, uh, if we, if enough people ask Tesla to, you know, provide the software update to have this feature, um, it could, in theory, be easily done. Um, and uh, it, one of the hallmarks of the plug and charge and North American charging standard, those uh, uh, requirements is that um, it will provide greater native universal interoperability between like um, inverters, batteries, stationary batteries, and electric vehicles that are just not Tesla brand, but just any electric vehicle. So um, hopefully then uh, the, once this feature is implemented that uh, it'll get rolled into the North American charging standard and that then um, any vehicle that has a North American charging standard plug uh, would be able to, again, do this balancing act of uh, just charging the car at the rate at which excess solar is available. Um, not everybody will want this uh, charging scheme because let's say, you know, you need to go on a road trip and you need that car battery charged 100%. Um, before you you leave, um, you don't really care if you're buying, you know, uh, kilowatt hours from the grid. You just want the car charged, um, you know, and that's a valid, um, you know, desire uh, for that scenario. But, you know, if you're just trying to um, putt putt around town, then, you know, it doesn't matter whether the car is at 20% charge or 40% charge or 60% charge. I mean, you're still going to be able to get to the grocery store and back. Um, and in that case, then, um, that's a really kind of perfect scenario for uh, if you ever have run into the situation of um, just wanting to charge at the rate of um, excess solar energy availability and not have to buy anything from the grid and not have to sell anything to the grid. Um, so uh, I look forward to um, this charging scheme becoming uh, more uh, commonplace. Um, and I, I think that the uh, the, st the standards that uh, have been put in place will, will make it happen. Um, and then uh, kind of an unfortunate or fortunate, depending on how you look at it, um, a uh, thing that's happened in the last 12 months is um, 
electric utilities are proposing very, very high uh, rate changes for uh, this coming year. Uh, for example, Portland General Electric um, proposed and they got approved for a 17.2% uh, rate change, uh, rate increase uh, for residential customers. And so um, the, good the good side of this is that, you know, for folks that have uh, solar, then um, net metering is still uh, in, in, in place. And so um, this is just making the excess energy that's generated from net metering that much more valuable um, and therefore reducing the uh, payback period, so to speak, of the solar array. And it's also more ammo and incentive for folks who don't have solar to get uh, solar because um, the payback periods will be better uh, when the value of the electricity generated is higher. <laughs> um, but uh, the disadvantage of rate increases is that, well, if you don't have solar, you're just going to pay 17.2% more and that's painful. So <clears throat> um, uh, the reason for these changes are numerous. Um, there, the grid is, as most people know, is uh, s severely um, under-maintained. And so um, now uh, the time has come to make major uh, grid upgrades uh, and maintenance to the grid. And so in order to cover the cost of those upgrades and maintenance, um, they have to get the money somehow. And so they get it by increasing rates for their customers. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is going to good causes. It's not that, um, you know, uh, executives are just stuffing this extra money into their pockets and going on, you know, lavish vacations. No, it really is going to, you know, workers and, uh, hard and hardware that to make the grid, uh, more reliable and resilient. So, um, you can look at it how you want, but it, that's just the reality. Um, and so that kind of brings us to the inclusion. Uh, which is that going solar is continuing to get less expensive. Uh, equipment is easier and easier to install. Electric rates are continuing to get more expensive. Um, vehicle to home is maturing with products scheduled to be available in 2024. And net zero carbon can be done, but it is harder to do than net zero energy uh, to achieve. Um, so that's kind of the conclusions. Uh, I do want to put a plug on next green energy series. Um, which is uh, going to be on December 9th at 10 in the morning. Um, the title is Making the Trades Cool. Um, and we're going to discuss kind of what is being done um, to address this a skill shortage in all trades um, and uh, how to make these trades more attractive and cool. Um, so I'll share with you things that, you know, the federal government is trying to do, um, things that Oregon has uh, has in their roadmap to try to help uh, make the trades cool and more attractive. Um, and, uh, you know, this is really important because, you know, uh, for a lot of people, they're not going to install their own solar. They're not going to install their own home battery. They're not going to install their own home vehicle to home charger. They're going to hire, you know, a solar installer or hire an electrician to do these things. Uh, but with the current skilled labor shortage, uh, these trades are uh, able to, um, garnish a very high rate. And so it's very expensive to hire an electrician or solar installer. Um, and then also not only, even if you're willing to and able to pay, uh, getting on their calendar is uh, quite a challenge. Um, sometimes you have to wait months or something like that to get somebody who now has an availability in the calendar to come to your house to do anything for you. Uh, so um, solving this uh, skilled labor shortage uh, is really important uh, if we want to continue to see um, the growth and adoption of solar and uh, vehicle to home technology and so on and so forth. So Edward, Linda has a couple of questions in the Q&A for you. Okay, well, here, let's click on it. Um, how do Portland General Electric uh, rates compare to nationwide? Um, we are slated to be high. Um, so I'm thinking we are like top uh, we're top 35 percentile. We're definitely not going to be ending up being like in the top 20 percent, though. So because uh, like New York State and the Northeast part of the U.S. has really high electric rates. Uh, Maui and most of Hawaii has rates that are 
close to 40 cents a kilowatt hour. So um, this 17% change uh, will put us probably in like the 18 cents per kilowatt hour range. Um, but 18 cents is still like half the rate of Maui, which is 40. So um, we're not going to be, you know, number one or number two, uh, but uh, it will put us, you know, much higher. And uh, there is much cheaper electricity um, out there. Um, like uh, Richland, Washington has uh, electricity that's like eight cents a kilowatt hour. So um, we will, Portland General Electric will be more than double Richland's rates. Um, and then same thing with like Utah. Utah, I think has like, Park City or Utah and like uh, Salt Lake City, Utah is like residential rates that are like 11 cents. Uh, so we'll be maybe getting close to double uh, Salt Lake City's rate. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's not great, but uh, it, it, we're, we're not, it could be worse is how, how I'm trying to say it. Um, and then, yeah, uh, Mark is also saying in the chat that press, Pacific Power is also raising their rates. So uh, if you think that you can move to a Pacific Power uh, region or territory uh, to escape these rate changes, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, and there's another question. Uh, are there any issues to adding the larger PV panels to a current system? Um, so no, if you have power optimizers. So power optimizers, um, uh, there's a company called Tygo, or uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but I think it's Tygo. Um, that will actually adjust the voltage and current of different panels. You can put a, a this different um, make and model size panels. And what it'll do is um, through communication between the different optimizers, it'll adjust the voltage and amperage so that you get a smooth um, and optimized uh, electric flow between these different panels. Um, originally, the those optimizers were designed so that it will be able to provide smooth and uninterrupted uh, energy flow when you have partial shading on certain panels. So certain panels are not producing anywhere close to um, their rated energy outputs. And, and to have those shaded panels not become an impediment to the overall production of the system. But uh, those optimizers can also be used to help uh, optimize different size PV panels to uh, all work well together. So that's very doable. Okay, um, other questions? And also, uh, uh, Carrie, um, you maybe if it's not enabled already, you can also uh, enable folks to unmute if they want to unmute and uh, ask the question without typing. Yeah, if anybody would like to do that. Um... People can post in the chat. Or maybe or answered all of our questions. Thanks for another great talk, Edward. Wonderful. I how quickly things have changed for the better. Yes. And, uh, yeah, and then we just need to get more people trained up to put this all into place for us. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Look awesome. forward to, to next uh, next talk, Saturday, December 9th. All right. Linda says okay. thank you. Okay, super. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Happy Saturday. All right. Thank you. Everybody Bye. take care.